Wonderful. Well, if everyone is ready, we only have an hour. And so I would love to go ahead and get started and folks can join us as we as we go. Uh, and please continue to put your favorite band books in the chat. We'd love to see those as we go and, and folks can, um, can do that throughout. So my name is Angela Anzano. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a, a general civil liberties policy and advocacy strategist here at the ACLU of Illinois, which is a very fancy way of saying a lobbyist and attorney. Um, and part of my portfolio is First Amendment issues. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today. So that's why I'm here. My, my role is to be moderator. And after the introduction, and I hope to speak as little as possible so that we can hear from all of our wonderful panelists um, from across the Midwest. Um, so yes, welcome to Ban Books Across the Midwest, a conversation among ACLU affiliates, and we're really excited. A couple, of course, uh, housekeeping technical things to get started with. So we have an ACL, um, or sorry, an ASL interpretation um, live to your, at today's event. Uh, the interpreter Zoom screen will be pinned. If you're having any technical issues, please message ACLU Illinois events in the chat. We also will have live captions at today's event. To turn those on, you click the show captions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And if you're having any difficulty viewing the captions, again, please message ACLU uh, Illinois events in the chat. That's a, a theme you'll see. Um, and a note about any questions, if you have them, you absolutely can submit them throughout the event using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll try and get to those either throughout or um, at the end. And thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions in advance. I have those. And again, we've tried to weave some of those in throughout, and then we'll also include some of them at the end. So looking forward to getting to those questions that folks have submitted. Um, again, any tech-related questions, please me message ACLU Illinois events in the chat. So as we all know, this is a critical moment nationwide, as well as, as in each of our states individually, to be having this really important conversation about banned books, content censorship, how we can protect freedom of expression and the right to learn nationwide in each of our states and in our local communities. And I'm excited to hear about what the landscape of this looks like in each of these Midwestern states that are here today. In Illinois, as many of you may know, our legislature and the Secretary of State's office did spearhead legislation that was recently signed, which is intended to protect libraries from attempts to ban books. But we are certainly still seeing censorship attempts at the local level in particular all across the state, libraries, in schools, and in the public square. So we're really thrilled to have this opportunity as a nationwide organization to come together for this broader conversation and really lift up the incredible work that each of these panelists and affiliates are doing on this call. We're really thankful for their time and, and sharing uh, with us today and our ability to collaborate and be a resource to one another in this fight. Uh, so I want to go ahead and introduce the panelists quickly and then we'll get started. And um, just so folks have kind of an idea of what today is going to look like, we're going to talk a little bit about the broader landscape, then we're going to talk a little bit about each affiliate's specific work, then um, as many of your questions were about actually that folks submitted earlier, we're going to talk about specific actions that you all can take in your communities and in your states, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, panelists. We have Katie Blair, who's the Advocacy and Public Policy Director at the ACLU of Indiana. We have Justice Growl, who's the Director of Community Engagement at the ACLU of Wisconsin. We have Scout Richters, who's the Policy Director at ACLU of Nebraska. And we have Anthony uh, Rothert, who's the Director of Integrated Advocacy at the ACLU of Missouri. And so I'm going to go ahead and kick off today's conversation with a question for all the panelists. And you all can uh, go in, um, in the order that I that I just introduced you, perhaps, is the, <laughs> is the easiest way to, to, to go. Uh, so what are you all observing in your state in terms of book bans, censorship efforts, and what factors do you see as contributing to this activity? All right. Well, thanks for calling on me first, Angela. <laughs> um, uh, but what we're seeing is, our legislature is becoming more and more radically conservative, as are our school boards, library boards, all of those things. And so even this year, the book banning legislation in Indiana that was passed on a state level, um, it had taken years and years to even get a hearing. And so we're just seeing after years of back and forth, these efforts finally taking off and it's devastating. 
Yes. Uh, thanks for having us. This is great. And to piggyback off of that, in Wisconsin, in the last couple of years, we've seen moves to censor content available to students at the state and local levels. Um, and a lot of these bills that are being introduced would ban the conversation of race and gender in the classroom. And really, these bills are they provide an avenue to criminalize teachers, librarians, and any other staff at public and private elementary and high schools for exhibiting quote unquote obscene material to minors. We are seeing things at the school board level that would ban things like pride flags or the Black Lives Matter science in the classrooms. And we understand that these bills and policies are not original. They are copies of things that have been introduced in the past across the country. And it's just a way for extreme politicians to rally their base. Um, even local board elections have become really political over the past couple of years. We see people running for office and campaigning on issues like parental rights and not making white kids feel guilty. And they're really explicit about not wanting diversity to be celebrated in schools. Great, thank you so much for including Nebraska in this conversation. Um, in Nebraska, we have seen a huge uptick in these efforts just in the course of, of the last several months. Um, we've seen at least three different districts um, that have recently attempted to ban books. Um, and you know, I, I think that this really just goes hand in hand with recent efforts we've seen uh, to ban healthcare for, for young Nebraskans, to, to ban uh, trans, kids from participating in sports or using the restrooms that are consistent with their gender, gender identity um, and attempts to, to ban CRT as well. And um, we see that many of the books that are being banned are by and about LGBTQ plus people in addition to those by and about people of color. Um, and I think all of these efforts, um, including book banning, are really efforts to erase people um, with marginalized identities. And, and they are all led by, by the same, at least in Nebraska, and I think this is be true everywhere, but the same small but very vocal um, minority. But we know that the majority of Nebraskans support the, the ability of trans Nebraskans to live as their authentic selves. Um, and unfortunately, those in power and leadership positions frequently don't represent these values and either are part of these extremist groups or are swayed by that vocal minority. And in Missouri, we're seeing what's being seen in the other states uh, largely. In addition though, um, we, we've had legislation state, uh, for the state, the entire state um, to try to force school districts to be stricter about uh, the books as it keeps and uh, more lenient uh, uh, when challenges com come from the public. Uh, I think that in addition to all the other reasons that have been mentioned, uh, books are being banned because there's a distrust of public institutions and there are lots of reasons uh, for that. But as part of that, distrust schools have become the uh, real focus for uh, regressive politics and political game playing and uh, books and, and students are the victims of that. Uh, Tony, I really like what you said about the way that sort of governmental distrust plays in with a lot of this as well. And a lot of you spoke about the intersection between the rise in content censorship and identity, right? And how uh, particularly books that positively affirm marginalized groups and, and are being targets. Um, do any of you have anything else that you'd like to say about that? I know, um, you know, just as you mentioned it a little bit, Katie, um, I think you went first and other folks talked about that. So if anyone, feel free to jump in if anyone has anything else they'd like to say about sort of the why these books that that positively affirm marginalized groups are seem to be the main target of these types of challenges. I would say that there seems to be a, um, you know, perspective that our schools are all of a sudden super welcoming of kids, you know, trans kids, um, children of color, things like that. Um, we know from experience that that's not necessarily the case, but there's just this whole, you know, theory that that's what's happening and that's what's really driving these. 
And it's an effort to like Scout said, erase us. And in Missouri, the the first books that were being banned uh, were exclusively uh, by or about people of color or LGBT uh, folks. And uh, since uh, other books have been banned, but but really it led the way as as a way of targeting uh, those populations. And I think it's important to ask ourselves why what is about reading another different story going to do to you? Like those are the questions that we need to ask our loved ones, our friends, our colleagues, because that reading about a different story will do nothing but make you more empathetic and compassionate to people have been who, who have been historically excluded, right? And I think the reason why we are seeing the attempt of banning so many things in our state is because bigoted beliefs are so fragile, right? So if you expose the truth or a different side of the story, people will fall apart and they will have to reassess their way of life, their beliefs and how they move in our world. That's so powerful. And it, it makes me think, um, you know, I think we've all heard that, you know, books are, are doors or window, windows and uh, windows and doors, right? Or um, mirrors, <laughs> windows and mirrors. Uh, I was like, doors is not right. Windows are, and doors are the same, uh, windows and mirrors. Um, and I think you're right, right, that we that we need to continue to have those conversations. And that, that'll that be part of what we talk about at the end in terms of um, having conversations with loved ones, just as that was a question somebody asked, you know, how can I have these conversations with my loved ones? So I'm so glad you touched on that. Um, Tony, I want to go back quickly to something you said about um, kind of the um, the core work that, that this in terms of um, um, racial identity and, and LGBT identity, and that I know that ACLU of Missouri has really named education equity as a core priority area, um, which is very intersectional with this. And can you talk a little bit about the specific initiatives that you're pushing to combat disparities in education and how that intersects with efforts against classroom censorship that your team is working on? So we've begun uh... Our, our work in education equity in trying to attack the disparities of um, in discipline, uh, especially discipline related uh, to student behavior and trying to reduce the punitive responses to student behavior that are very prevalent in our state. Uh, Missouri has uh, the, the worst racial disparities uh, in the country. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done. We also have um, punishments that uh, my understanding is people in other states find surprising. Uh, so what one of the specific punishments we're trying to eliminate um, or uh, or at least reduce disparities is corporal punishment. Um, the another is uh, reducing or eliminating, uh, suspensions, especially for young students. We have a 180-day suspension uh, that's allowed, which is uh, very, very disruptive uh, to, to the school uh, schooling of any student. Um, and we've also done some work uh, on, on the use of restraints. So um, that is those are what we're doing in education equity. Uh, we, as far as censorship, it's it's tied in because, as that has already been mentioned, uh, part of making people feel included in school uh, is having voices that uh, resonate with them uh, available, stories available for them. Um, we we have two pieces of litigation. Um, going <laughs> one one is just against the school district for its particular uh, particularly bad uh, policy, but the other challenges a new state law uh, that imposes criminal penalties on uh, school officials if they provide a, well school officials and anyone associated with the school if they provide uh, explicit sexual materials to uh, any student inside or outside of school. And that sounds really good, except that uh, sexually explicit has been defined in a way that instead of being the type of obscenity that schools absolutely 
can censor under Supreme Court precedent, um, it, it means offensive to to somebody. Uh, and who that somebody is, is not, not, not defined in that law. So we represent the uh, Missouri School Library Association uh, and the Missouri Library Association in, uh, in that case and are, are trying to uh, get that law struck down. But it has already resulted in uh, a lot of self-censorship across the state. Uh, school boards are nervous. Uh, people have had the police called on them. <laughs> the police have come out to investigate. Uh, so the, uh, the, the people are staring way clear of anything that might fall uh, afoul of the law to stop themselves from having to go to jail. Uh, we also have a model policy, which is mostly uh, the American Library Association's uh, policy. Uh, there is a new rule in effect that requires school districts to have uh, to have a policy specific on challenging books. So if it's going to be a policy, we would like a First Amendment friendly one. So we're shopping that around uh, uh, school districts uh, to try to build momentum for it to get adopted uh, in, in some of the more than 500 school districts in the state. Thanks, Tony. I think um, two things that you said that I, I that really resonated with me. One is um, how important the uh, definitions are. Right, a law can um, sound good on its face. And anyone I think on this call who does legislative or policy work knows that the the devil's in the details in terms of how are we defining these these um, these terms. And I think especially in a First Amendment context. And then a uh, big shout out to our friends over at the American Library Association and, and our, our friends at the Illinois Library Association. I agree with you. We've really um, focused in our work as well on lifting up their already existing First Amendment friendly great policies and, and guidelines that can be utilized to, um, to sort of show that this is the way forward that is, um, you know, um, that protects everyone um, and their First Amendment rights. So I appreciate you lifting that up. Um, uh, turning to, to Katie, um, how you mentioned in your introductory remarks about um, classroom censorship bills in Indiana. And so how uh, do those bills allow individuals to censor classroom content? And what do you see as the potential consequences of those bills? Yeah, thank you for that. Ours it sounds very similar, actually, to Missouri's. Anyone can make a complaint that they believe a book is harmful to minors in a school um, library setting, and it opens up because of this teachers, school librarians, principals to be criminally prosecuted if that material is deemed harmful to minors. And so we've got a lot of school officials really concerned about this impact um, on their rights and also just really scared to go to jail. So it's it's really a hard time. Absolutely. I think the, the idea of self-censorship, right, that um, these laws create a ripple effect, um, um, not just the letter of the law, but sort of the ripple effect of folks self-censoring themselves. Um, and um, Scout and Justice, if you could both talk a little bit about how your states have responded to similar proposed legislation and policy changes, and especially I think in our previous conversations, um, critical race theory came up. So especially as it relates to critical race theory, we'd love to hear from you both about that. Um, maybe Scout and then Justice. Sure. So we have seen a fair number of these efforts in, in the last few years, beginning um, with the University of Nebraska Board of Regents in 2021. Uh, our current governor, Jim Pillen, was on the Board of Regents at the time, and he brought a proposal to ban critical race theory at the University of Nebraska. Luckily, his pro proposal was rejected, but now we have him as our governor. Um, but in, in responding to that Board of Regents proposal, um, we, along with partners at the Anti-Defamation League and the NAACP, distributed a petition to really help raise the call um, that this was going on. And students showed up in droves to, to voice their opposition to, to that resolution. 
Coming off of this victory, there have been several bills introduced in the legislature, including one this January that carries over into the 2024 session. Um, that bill um, would require uh, Nebraska school districts to make their materials available for public inspection, uh, create a process uh, similar to what Katie and Tony were talking about, uh, but create a process for parents to object to books in the school library and then also prohibit CRT. So um, that bill, all of the bills already had a hearing that were introduced last session. So we came out in strong opposition, obviously, to this bill at the committee hearing level and then um, you know, raised alarm bells to, to recruit ACLU supporters to testify in opposition to, to this really harmful and dangerous piece of legislation. Um, last year, we had a state legislator introduce a bill that they said was about preventing indoctrination and reverse racism in the classroom. The representative who wrote the bill attached a long list of terms to his testimony that he said would be banned from being taught under the bill. And it was really ridiculous. And I just want to read a few of the words for you that they he had in his testimony. So it was anti-racism, affinity groups, diversity, equity, and inclusion, educational justice, land acknowledgement. And this list goes on and on and on. And at the state level, extreme politicians know that our governor is going to veto these bills, but they do them anyway. So the ACLU and other organizations who care deeply about education have turned up in large numbers to testify against bills like these. Justice, I think that we have used every term that you said so far, either in the chat or to the internet. <laughs> panel. Um, so uh, I think we, uh, we have, you know, might have to be careful. Um, no, I think um, that's, uh, thank you very much. And Scout, you talked a little bit about students, sort of uh, the positive effects of the students mobilizing around these bills um, against them. Um, do you have anything else that what impact is this having on educators and then and students in the classroom as well? Yeah, I mean, I think as um, others have touched on, the impacts of, of these proposals and these types of policies are really severe. Um, they really stoke that culture of fear among educators. Um, you know, am I going to be turned in by an unhappy parent? I think that it really chills the expression and, and free discussion that is so important for young people um, to really develop critical thinking skills. And, you know, this idea that teachers have some kind of agenda and want to brainwash children is simply absurd. But unfortunately, that rhetoric is very strong among those seeking to ban books and seeking to ban CRT. And Justice, what have you all seen in Wisconsin in terms of community engagement efforts around this topic? So something that I want to name that like the fear is really real and I want to acknowledge that especially if we have participants feeling that fear like that is real and your emotions are completely valid. Um, something that we've done in community engagement efforts is really teaching about the diversity of thought and kind of celebrating that so working with youth and children and parents and caregivers to understand the value of having these difficult conversations and the emotional resilience that comes with it. Um, last week, our affiliate did a banned book event called um, Celebrating Diversity of Thought, where we read The Day You Began by Jacqueline Woodson, and we offered resources on how to have the conversation. So it was this one pager of like, here are questions that you can ask to really kind of think bigger about what this book makes you feel. We um, Participants left with the actual banned book, and then we modeled it for our community as well. Um, and that was something that was really beautiful because we understand that the fear is real. So registration was required. We did not take photos of the children in the room. Um, giving the book to trusted teachers and trusted um, student parent groups, so they can give it to parents or teachers who didn't feel safe to be in the room so they could still access that material. Um, lastly, we're always empowering BIPOC communities because we know that when we ban books, we are erasing their stories. You, When we ban books, we are erasing my ancestors' stories. My story as a Black woman, my son as a Black boy, my neighbor's story, my neighbor's story as a person of color. So that's something that we have been doing in Wisconsin. 
Thank you. I think uh, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think, um, you know, the per personalizing it and acknowledging the fear. I know we saw that in some of the Q&A we got both ahead of time and that we've gotten here right um, today. Um, so I really appreciate you you lifting that up. Um, and I guess uh, related to that, um, in terms of some of where that fear is coming from, um, wanting to um, pivot a little bit to talk a little bit about um, Katie and, and Scout, you can can start us off with uh, groups like Moms for Liberty, for example, that many folks on the call have heard of, have gained prominence in advocating for this kind of censorship across various states nationwide um, in their local communities in particular. And how has their influence impacted your work? How do you respond to these so-called community-driven efforts to influence book bans, curriculum, and other forms of censorship? I know that in Illinois, here, our Moms for Liberty group um, um, is also called Awake, Awake Illinois. So I know there may be variations of that, but um, these sort of groups that um, that are really spearheading a lot of these efforts, as I think somebody said earlier, is sort of the small vocal minority um, of folks. So uh, Katie and then Scout. Yeah, in Indiana, they're called Purple for Parents. I don't know where purple comes into this. Um, justice for purple, but um, yes, it's definitely a thing here. Um, what we try to lift up is that these are outside groups and they are not, many of which are not parents, many of which are not even Hoosiers, and they're still influencing legislation. They don't speak for their constituents and what they are saying is inaccurate. What we do is we usually identify their main claims, which is easy because they're not very creative. Um, then we identify a partner who is an actual issue area expert to counter their argument and leave, lead with facts and experience. Yeah, <clears throat> we have seen groups like Moms for Liberty. We have um, others in Nebraska, including um, one that calls themselves the Nebraska Freedom Coalition, um, really become more engaged in the legislature and really emboldened to say, whatever they want, including outright lies and, and misinformation. Um, these, these groups, I think, as this question um, alluded to, tout themselves as really communi community driven, but it is very quickly dispelled when you see the same three people at every opportunity to engage with law and policy makers. It's literally the same three to four people at legislative hearings, at school board meetings, and at city city council meetings. And so what we try to do is engage the community who may not know the extent of what is going on um, in terms of, of that censorship. And um, it's about kind of mobilizing those who, who see the danger in what these extremist groups are trying to do. And, and we encourage people to, to share their own personal stories about the value of diverse authors and diverse subject matter um, being available. Thanks. I love, I think we're, uh, as much as we may have had a structure, we're skipping ahead a little bit to the, uh, which I really love the, what can you do, right? The um, the lessons folks can kind of glean about um, sharing their personal stories and, and mobilizing in their communities. And so we'll talk more about that. Um, before we do that, just um, a couple final questions in the, in the sort of substantive portion before we get to ways to take action. So um, Tony, um, we've sort of talked a little bit around this um, earlier, but um, just kind of explicitly, how how does censorship play into perpetuating the school to prison pipeline? I know that's an issue that's really important to a lot of folks on this call. Um, and can you kind of elaborate on your efforts to eliminate that pipeline? Um, what progress has been made? And then, and then yes, the intersection and, and, and how that, um, how that plays into what we're talking about today. Really, really key to the school to prison pipeline uh, working is that students get disconnected from their community. Um, you know, largely through discipline, and that's one of the ways that we we are talking about. But also, um, that can happen from books being banned as well. Uh, it'll, like we've talked, like others have said, it eliminates uh, black and brown voices from education, um, and it it also uh, eliminates important conversations. Um, I. Uh, spoke to someone who, who when they read The Bluest Eye, uh, the, uh, Toni Morrison's account of child abuse uh, was her real uh, beginning to understand her own uh, child abuse and what had happened to her as a child and beginning to be able to 
uh, put words to what had happened. Uh, that would not have happened with, without the book and and uh, and uh, and exposure to it. Um, it also prevents uh, banning books, prevents exposure to uh, the kind of ideas and different ideas that will build uh, critical thinking skills. Uh, and, and those kind of skills are important to uh, making decisions that uh, keep one out of uh, a prison uh, um, eventually. So it's, it's important uh, that students not only be in school, but that they have access uh, and exposure to ideas. And um, we've made some uh, progress. We've used our, our nonpartisan standing uh, fairly effectively to uh, forge a coalition of Democrats and Republicans in Missouri to, um, to, to place some limits, uh, some, some really strong limits on the use of restraint, which was being overused uh, quite a bit in Missouri. And we've made some progress in corporal punishment. Now parents have to be notified that corporal punishment has been used with their, on their student and, uh, and parents have the opportunity to opt their child out of corporal punishment, uh, both things that were not possible uh, before. Wow, and thank you for sharing that really powerful example of how the, the sort of uh, power that in books can have on somebody um, and, and their, their life trajectory. So appreciate that. Um, before we move on, because I think you've, you have in some ways um, led us well, nicely into um, my next question, but I just want to um, open it up to any of the panelists. If there's anything else you'd like to say about what your affiliates are doing, anything else to say on the school to prison pipeline issue, education equity, anything like that. All right, I'll take your <laughs> silence as um, as a sense to move on. Um, so, uh, Tony, you spoke a little bit about this just now, but um, I'd love to hear from from all the panelists about if there are legislative strategies or models that have been effective in countering these censorship efforts. And each of you have touched on this a little bit, but if there's anything else you'd like to say, um, you know, in states that have less than favorable legislatures, which it sounds like maybe a few folks on this call, uh, what has been your approach to uh, broaching this subject with legislators? And are there areas of agreement you found kind of similar to what Tony has, Tony was talking about earlier? So Tony, if you want to start us off uh, with anything else you'd like to say about yours, and then we can um, go around. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'd like to hear from others. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do we want to get uh, Katie Scout Justice? I can go. Um, the strategy that's been most effective for us is working with coalition partners that are closer to the issue. So working with the Indiana State Teachers Association, the Indiana Library Federation, the State Parent Teacher Organization, as well as our, you know, racial justice advocacy groups and our LGBTQ advocacy groups. And so also identifying sometimes the ACLU isn't the best messenger. And so who is and making sure that that we lift those people up. Yeah, we have not really had the ability to be proactive in this effort, just given the defensive posture that we find ourselves in. One thing that we try to help senators and elected officials understand that I think resonates with some of them is that opposing book bans um, does not mean opposing parents' rights. Um, you know, I think we can find the common ground that parents should have the right to, to make decisions about the materials that their kids are consuming. They should not have the right to make those decisions for all kids in public schools. And I do think that that point has um, helped make some inroads with um, some senators or officials that may be on the fence or maybe uh, may have been inundated with opposition messaging. So I think that's one um, point that we've we've been able to use somewhat successfully. And I alluded earlier to our pushing of our policy or the ALA's slightly modified policy uh, to school districts. We've used the uh, legislature uh, bill against itself. Um, they, they wanted, they required, they decided they were going to require every school district to have a policy. So every school district's worried about that and wants to have a policy. So if they're going to have one, we'll have a good one, which replaces bad ones that were out there and uh, puts in a good policy where there 
was silence. I want to uplift what Katie said about sometimes the ACLU is not the best messenger. And I think that's so important. Why that, like why the importance of working with coalition partners and working with community who really have their boots and ears to the ground. Um, one thing that we've been doing is staying on top of tracking these bills in the legislature and publishing our summaries on a bill tracker that could be found on our website. And it highlights the ways these bills fall into nationwide patterns of classroom uh, censorship through explainers, it's memes, it's TikTok videos, really pushing that education because this advocacy work is really confusing and it's confusing on purpose. So we want to make sure that when we are explaining this to our community members or uplifting um, their messaging, that it's as accessible as possible. I think that we have been somewhat lucky with our governor, who is a former educator, a former superintendent of our state department's um, public instruction, to make sure that if these bills do pass, that he has his veto pen ready. I love what you said, Justice, about um, you know the sort of use of social media, um, lifting that up, and um, and yes, Tony, the idea of uh, well, if there's going to have to be a policy, let's let you know, let's be um, active about it being a good one. So that's great. Um, we talk, we've all been talking a little bit about the state level, um, and then and then some community level, but on the local level, have you seen any effective strategies when working with local governing boards, like? local school boards, library boards, city council meetings. I know in Illinois, that's where we're seeing a lot of the activity, um, less on the state level where we may have a more favorable legislative landscape on these issues, but on the local level, we're really seeing a lot of these, um, these um, fights at, like I said, local school boards, local library boards, local city council meetings. So would love to hear anything that you all have seen be effective in those meetings. Let's go backwards through uh, justice if you wanna go ahead and start. Yeah, so something that is really beautiful um, about Wisconsin is that our youth, they are so ready and they're loud and you just give them the resources, the material and they are willing and ready to show up. And we have that with our student alliance and some of our youth programming that we do annually at our Wisconsin affiliate. Um, so right now we're currently working on developing a school board advocacy toolkit to empower local grassroots organizations and students to keep pushing back on these harmful policies. And again, really breaking things down so it is accessible and digestible. So example of like, here's how to navigate your school district's website. Here's the policies on a curriculum or student discipline. And here's how you find the board meeting notes. So they have all that information and they are feeling empowered and want to protect and voice their own opinion with the support of um, community members and folks from the Wisconsin affiliate behind them. And this really kind of came out, unfortunately, of what we saw at the Waukesha School District. Uh, Melissa Temple, who was a first grade teacher, was fired after she criticized the district on social media for not letting her students sing Rainbow Land by Miley Cyrus. If you haven't heard that song, I highly suggest you play it. It's a great song. It's developmentally appropriate. Um, the district said that the song violated its policy against controversial issues in the classroom. So there was a massive large protest the day of the school board meeting where we had our legal observers turn out to make sure that members' rights to demonstrate was protected and to observe the large police presence. So we kind of got a landscape of what is to come when we will start seeing more pushback on book banning and censorship. Um, so developing that school board advocacy toolkit and making sure that we are supporting, whether it is just bringing legal observers or going into the classrooms and teaching about, here's an advocacy toolkit. Um, so, yeah. I loved everything you said. Um, I think that, so we just developed a, um, it's not specific to local level, but a book banning toolkit. Shout out to Carter Matt. I think he's on this webinar. He was a law clerk that helped us develop this toolkit. Um, but it does include resources for how to engage at the local level. Um, because we know obviously that local officials are often in the best position to protect books. So that's something we've developed and are, are um, working toward getting more engaged um, or engaging more people into this issue and, and really uplifting um, experiences of people that have been affected by book bans or, or want to speak out against them.
Tony or Katie, anything to say about the local level? I I will say, I mean, what's been said about working with coalition partners and um, and students is is true here as well. I'll just observe that there's been nothing more effective uh, than uh, than having students go to their school boards and speak. Um, they really stand in contrast to to the people, the folks who are challenging uh, books. One thing that hasn't been mentioned is making sure that the media is aware that this is going on, um, making sure that this doesn't happen in the dark. That's been really effective and has helped kind of stop some things moving through our local school boards here in Indiana. That's a great point, you know, engaging uh, for folks who have communications, uh, folks that are, you know, great at communications and, and have those connections to media, making sure that that's being lifted up um, for sure. And um, I think which is a couple more questions on ways to take action and really sort of narrowing down even more on the personal level, I think, in terms of how folks on this call can take action. Um, and then, um, you know, we can talk about some cute, um, some of the questions as well. But I know a lot of those were about this. How can we, um, people asked about how they can take action, how can they take action as, you know, a person I think is just as lifted up, um, who may have marginalized identities, as folks who, for example, are in faith communities, some folks were asking how they specifically could take action and, and lift up their voices. Um, so we had a lot of really great variations on that question. So definitely wanting to get to that. And I think something, Justice, that you talked about at the very beginning, and I, and I would love to hear from everyone on this is, you know, kind of bringing it right into our families and our homes. You know, how do we facilitate dialogue on banned books and censorship in a way that promotes understanding um, with our friends, our families, our loved ones? How do we have these conversations with each other? I can talk more if you want me to about it. Um, something that we've been doing at my home with my five-year-old is really starting at the preschool level books that have been banned. I know this sounds really silly, but it's a really great practice. So again, The Day You Begin um, is a book that we have at home and we read it together and we kind of talk of like, what emotions did you feel? What did you like about this book? And really using open-ended questions so you get more than a yes and a no and being open to learning from your youth, your kids, learning from people um, and trusting that those are emotions are real and valid and giving them the space and the tools to really understand what those emotions mean and continue to have these conversations. Um, I always say start with some folks that you trust because that gives you a more sense and more confidence of how to have these discussions. So I practice with my five-year-old all the time and that makes me feel more confident going into spaces, um, whether that's to help or to facilitate these discussions. But Start with people who are in your circle that you trust to have these conversations and really acknowledging the emotions that come up and kind of ask yourself, like, why am I feeling this way? And I think to name it is really powerful and to have to be able to explain it is also powerful, right? There's so much powerful and vulnerability. And you get that a lot when you are in safe spaces. I, I think another uh, thing that's been effective is um to find out <laughs> what books are being banned uh, around you and uh, talk to people about uh, specific books they might know or authors they might know um, or, you know, be able to describe the book. I think there is this assumption out there that uh, when we're talking about banned books, we're talking about, you know, dirty words and bad things. Uh, and, you know, it's really, really not. Um, and, um when people learn that, they become a little more outraged than they were before uh, about the banning of books. Also kind of a, a both and approach. Um, so, you know, explaining you can absolutely restrict the content that your child takes in and nobody is trying to stop you personally, but you can't do it for everyone. And that's been a really effective way to kind of talk about it. Like we're not trying to take anything away from you. This is just, you know, how it is. 
I don't think I have anything <laughs> new to add, but I agree with all of those comments. So, yeah. Thanks, Scout. And Tony, um, one, one thing you had said, and this was actually in the Q&A that we got ahead of time, was how can folks find out, either if you or somebody else wants to answer, how can folks find out um, what the book banning efforts are in their communities? Um, you know, what books are trying to be banned? Which school districts, this is libraries, this is happening at? Kind of where, where do you have a resource for where folks can find that information? <laughs> I'm putting you a little bit on the spot on that one. Uh, I don't have a good resource. Um, <laughs> uh, we try um, and reporters get the First Amendment, so they're happy to cover book bans. Uh, yeah. And and I think that uh, watching the news <laughs> and the newspaper in particular uh, to, for uh, stories about books that are being banned in school districts that are doing it in your area is probably the best resource. And I think that just goes to Katie's earlier point that we don't want them to do this in the dark and that's exactly what they're trying to do. Um, they're trying to rush these through, not let anyone know about it and, and ban them without the public having an opportunity to engage. So I think, I think the fact that we don't have resources that people can directly find um, what books are being banned is by design from, from, from others. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of nods and yeses from panelists. I think that that's right. I think um, what we do know, Tony, great point, right? Um, the the media often covers these things, especially local, you know, local community media. And I think um, throughout um, our wonderful events team at ACLU Illinois has been putting resources as affiliates have been talking about it. So a lot of the toolkits that people have mentioned are in there, are in the chat. Um, as well as I know they've put some information from the American Library Association. And um, I know that each you know, state library association and other, other resources like that, uh, Pen America, others have resources around book bans and what books are being banned. And, um, and some of that even drills down into more local communities. So I'll, I'll add that, that I think there are some resources out there that, um, that also can help, you know, I think um, leaning on our community members who are keyed into it, right? Teachers and, and um, educators and, and community community, uh, parents, and, and, um, and as Justice said, our youth, uh, what are they seeing, um, you know, in their schools as well. So I think that those are all great resources. So uh, I think one, the biggest question we got, um, and we talked a little bit about this, like I said, with the toolkits and everything else, is there anything else that you want folks on this call to know that they can do to take action? Um, you know, uh, you know, specific action items that folks can do to really join this fight and stand up and speak out in their communities. Yes, um, there are so many school districts and they are so small that it's impossible for little affiliates like us to to really even know what's happening in in a large part of the large swaths of this our states so find out what the policy is on book challenges in the, your school district um and if they have a policy that's different from uh the model policy ask them to adopt it if you hand it to someone on paper uh, and make it easy for them um, or email it to them, uh, they're more likely to do it than uh, someone who's, you just say, well, it needs to be different. Uh, make, make it easy and it might happen. And uh, if if everyone on this call did that, we'd have a um, hundred or more uh, school, school districts with good policies instead of bad ones. And I, I guess point off what oh you go. I was gonna say also as a resource, the Right to Read Foundation uh maintains a list of uh books that are being banned and where. And uh that that is a resource that I forgot to mention. Sorry. Going off of what you just said, Tony, I would say um, and this isn't accessible for everyone, but showing up regularly to these public meetings and introducing yourself to lawmakers, getting familiar with them goes a long way, even for the most radically conservative folks. So that if you can make it happen, do. I think also knowing who represents you and who's on your school board and who's on your school district. Um, this can be done if you're in Wisconsin by my vote Wisconsin, and I can put that in the chat, but just understanding who's representing you, who is 
speaking on your behalf goes a long way. Yeah, I think all of that I would echo. And I think it's, I guess it's important to do all that I, to kind of go back to what we were talking about earlier is that um, people who want to ban books are more emboldened and engaged than ever. So we have to match that with the strategies that Justice Katie and Tony talked about. Thank you. I think this, this is great. And I will add that I know in Illinois, similar um, to Scott, what you were talking about in justice, we have also put together a workbook for folks to um, help them learn how, um, you know, empower folks to have the tools that they need to speak at these local community meetings and to attend them and to reach out to their legislators and, and some of the talking points around these issues. Because I think, you know, Tony, is, we, uh, we want to make sure that it's easy for uh, electeds and we also want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for folks who, you know, I as a as a working parent, I know that the idea of um, I think as Kate said, like going to these meetings and and being able to be involved can feel exhausting. So we want to make sure you know that we are helping um, you know to to make that as easy as possible. So we do have that workbook as well. So all of the things that are in the chat will also be sent out in the email afterwards. I want to make sure to lift that up. And I'm not sure if I said at the beginning that this is being recorded, and so it will be um, also posted afterwards if you have folks who couldn't join but but really wanted to be able to join. Um, and I think um, one, one question that I think is a great one and it's sort of related, and then I think this may be our last question that we have time for because I wanna to get to hearing about each of the panelists' band, book, band, band books at the very end, um, is for those who are in places maybe where this isn't happening and books aren't being banned in those communities, how can they help? Because I think we heard a lot about on the other side, you know, folks who are not members of those communities uh, being really active. And so I think we want to be cautious about that, but also how can folks who really want to help and are energized to help help, um, for example, folks in Illinois who may want to help some of um, some folks in other um, in your in your states. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I think continuing to shed light on this issue, it might not be happening in your home state or in your backyard, but it's important that this gets out there. And I do think there is a national conversation happening uh, around banning of books and largely the public's on our side. And as, as much as we can uh, show and highlight the the, the problems uh, with, with how it's occurring in school districts and where it's occurring, um, that affects the, affects the narrative for the whole nation. I think that's um, well said from both of you that um, in, you know, shedding light, I think we had some questions about proliferation of mis misinformation, you know, more information, more light, more facts and stories and personal impacts, I think, um, are always, always the most effective. And I, I hear a lot about um, from each of you about the messaging around, you know, um, sort of what happens in someone's family versus um, what happens in schools, um, you know, and, and making those decisions personal rather than public decisions. So um, we only have a couple more minutes and I want to be respectful of folks' time. And so what I would love to do is to finish with hearing a little bit from each of you about your favorite band books um, and anything else you want to add to this conversation before we go. Like I said, we've got um, about um, a minute potentially for each of you before we want to close. And so um, I will kick us off. I will say that my current favorite band book uh, that um, my son and I read is Heather Has Two Mommies. Um, and we love, we love that book. We love the messaging that all families are different. Um, um, but what really matters is that families love each other and that's what makes a family. And I think that kind of messaging, um, as Justice said earlier, is what creates empathetic and compassionate um, tiny humans who become um, adults <laughs> who are also uh, exhibiting those behaviors in their communities. So um, let's do uh, uh, Katie, Scout, Tony, Justice, and then I'll, I'll close this out. Well, Mike Pence is from Illinois. So we love a day in, or not Illinois, Indiana. Sorry. He's from here. So we love a day in the life of Marlon Bundo. 
Was I supposed to be next? I'm sorry. I kind of forgot the word. Okay. Um, well, when your name is Scout, it has to be To Kill a Mockingbird. So <laughs> I don't really have a choice in the matter. So <laughs> uh, my, my but favorite. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, my favorite band book is Cats versus Robots. Um, I like it because it's a, it, it helps highlight the absurdity of banning books uh, that this book was banned. But it also really surprised me because it tells an exciting and epic tale of the battle, the long simmering war between cats and robots that's happening directly beneath our noses. So highly recommended. I feel like I've mentioned this, but my favorite band book is The Day You Began by Jacqueline Woodson. And it just explains that it's okay to be different in a really accessible way. And I've read it so far four days in a row to my five-year-old. And it is something that we read uh, a lot. So that's my go-to. That's wonderful. I also like that so many of those were children's books. Um, I, think, <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of wonderful, and I know that we um, we had in the chat at the very beginning, we had a whole wonderful list of other folks' um, band books. And so um, I just, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank you all so much, not only for your time today, but for all of the work that you and your affiliates and your communities, your coalitions are doing on this issue. As I said at the beginning, um, and as as we've talked about, um, this is a, a critically important time for, the, for this particular issue nationwide. And I think um, the opportunity for us all to come together as separate affiliates and, and as one ACLU to, to have this discussion um, is just really um, exciting and energizing and inspiring to hear all the incredible work that everyone is doing. So I want to thank you all. Um, for that. And I do want to reiterate for, um, and I apologize, we did not get to everyone's questions. I tried to uh, to touch on most of them if I could, uh, but I do want to reiterate that the resources that are in the chat and the recording of this um, will all be sent out um, afterwards um, to the folks who registered um, via email. And um, we really look forward to this being the beginning, perhaps, of a conversation rather than um, just a one-off conversation, um, both um, um, at, you know, between our affiliates and then also um, with the panelists, um, the community that, that came together today, the 100 plus of you who joined us today. We're looking forward to continuing this conversation. So I want to thank you all. And